Bueno, para darle entonces eh, continuidad a los paneles del, del Foro Global Socioambiental de la Liga Internacional Socialista. Eh, ok, so to continue with this socio, Global Social Environmental Forum of the ISL, we will begin with this second forum that is called After the Footprint of the USSR, a social environmental assessment of bureaucratic socialism and the restoration of capitalism in Eastern Europe. We will have Alejandro Bodat from the Executive Committee of the ISL, Oleg Vernik, President of the Sakis Pratsi Union of Ukraine, Dmitry Saidov, an activist of the For Clean Air a ecological organization and a member of the Ukrainian Social League, and the comrade Manuel Romero Garcia of the Spanish-speaking collective SICCOM. So with no further ado, Alejandro Bodar, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for everyone again. The comrades of Ukraine has asked me to inform that unfortunately Dimitri is going to be late because in addition to being an environmental activist and a member of the Ukrainian Socialist League, he is also part of the territorial defense and he is in activity there and in about 20 minutes he will be done with his duties there and he will join this meeting. So beginning with our talk, the thing about environmental politics in the ex-USSR is an issue of permanent debates in the among the environmental organizations because there are different false ideologies around the issue. First, there are many who say that in uh, socialism, no one paid attention to the environmental issue. They confuse Stalinism with socialism. But there are comrades from revolutionary organizations that give very little importance to ecological issues because they have a productivist conception and we think that conception is has its origin in the practical application of socialism and forgets what the policies of the Russian of the first years of the Russian Revolution were. And they buy this outlook from Stalinism. There are capitalist ideologies that great confusion saying our ideas, our socialist ideas have a, you know, are an old thing and though many years have passed and it has to do with things of the past and there are new issues, but it is positive to go over what the real situation in the ex-Soviet Union was in the first place to have a better understanding and also to collaborate with the current discussions of a solution. A first issue that we think is very important for people who maybe don't know is that when the first workers government rose to power in 1917 under Lenin and Trotsky's leadership, they applied social environmental issues of a protection of the environment. Some of them were pioneer pol policies in a historical period when even the environmental problems were not as sharp as they are now. But when the czarist government had been a monarchical imperialist government that cared absolutely nothing for these things. The first government of 
the workers under Lenin and Trotsky and the Bolsheviks gave a lot of importance to the environmental issue. This is not very well known. For example, Lenin was permanently worried about these issues and he He sponsored a series of policies that were pioneer in the world at that time. In the first years of that government until 1920, for example, they created the first natural reserves with the conception that forests had to be taken care of to care for these zones for the future generations they not only protected the forests, but also the waters, the minerals. The hunting was prohibited within the reserves. So logging was prohibited in those reserves. So the ecology was protected in those areas and a series of scientists were tasked with studying the issue of how to exploit the nature without damaging and preserving nature for future generations. And we're talking about 1919, 1920, a series of species were also protected who were under threat of extinction, like the Siberian tiger and some calves. Some hunting weapons were prohibited. It was the first country in the world where hunting seasons were established. There's a time in which in the rest of the world, indiscriminate hunting throughout the year was allowed everywhere. And it was the first country that applied these measures, trying to prevent a hunting of certain species to be carried out in different periods. The scientific study of these issues was heavily sponsored. The organizations of, for the conservation of nature were given funding and some of their scientists were pioneer in this field. They even called on many scientists who were not part of the October Revolution, but who were taking up these issues and the revolutionary government hired them for this and, be, and these scientists became very famous who found things that are still used today. So the scientists that changed the conception of the ecology, scientists with Tiaboski that Lenin presented the idea of the reserve, the Kami. All these scientists, many of which did not agree with Bolshevism, ended up becoming Bolshevik because they found the first government that supported their studies and their causes. Unfortunately, many of these scientists then ended up in the jails or assassinated when the Stalinist counter-revolution took over and rolled back all of these measures. That's why there's a confusion where many people say that in the Soviet Union, socialism didn't care about the environment, but this is false. In the first years of the revolution, it was, they gave it a high importance with policies that were that are vanguard even today. Everything tends to say that uh, they only cared about production and not the environment. This happened, but this happened 
in the following period when the bureaucracy headed by Stalin defeated the revolution. We're not going to get into here how that counter revolution happened, but in the 1920s, this reversal in the hands of Stalin began to happen and all of the measures that were applied by Lenin and Trotsky's government were rolled back and reversed and policies that went entirely against nature, not only against nature, but also against workers as well. In the Stalinist period, surely the comrades who will speak after me will surely be able to explain better. But in the Stalinist period, they not only reversed the policies that Lenin and Trotsky's government had applied, but completely aggressive policies against the environment were taken up. So I'm going to get into just a couple of examples. For example, they destroyed during the Stalinist period, they destroyed the Assad Sea, which is a landlocked sea, was the fourth largest lake in the world, and they ended up completely drying it. It had 68,000 square kilometers, and they dried it up entirely by the 1970s. And this is because the Soviet economy wanted to develop the cotton industry, and so they drove the waters that fed that lake away towards that production and created, transformed the Sea of Assad into a desert. It's a, a sea that touches four republics of the ex-Soviet Union. And the result was not only a desertification, but also because of the pesticides that they used to develop the cotton industry ended up contaminating the underground water and the dust that was blown away from all of the pesticides and the contaminated dirt after the desertification had a tremendous impact in the entire region. Not only this, but they, the industrial sector that they wanted to develop, they not only destroyed the cotton industry that they had tried to develop with that policy, but they also destroyed the other industry, the textile industry that depended on that. Many of those reasons are just now beginning to recover from those disasters. A salt reserve on the coast of the Caspian Sea was completely dried by the 1980s because of the construction of a dam and a power station. These are two cases in which experts had warned of these consequences, but the bureaucracy paid no heed to this and advanced with these results. We have the nuclear accidents. Everyone knows about Chernobyl, but there was another one in Kiski, which was also very important. Again, not because, not because nuclear energy is contaminating in itself, which it is, but in addition to this, the consequences of a bad use of this technology. In Chernobyl, three fourths of the region's water, which is a huge region, is contaminated. There's 30 square kilometers that are entirely contaminated, but there is 200, 200,000 square kilometers 
around the Chernobyl reactor that are contaminated. 20,000 years will pass before that area is recovering. So the flora and fauna in that region is recovering, but those animals are contaminated and malformed and there's a lot of many disasters. Many species were ex extinct. Many species were exterminated. There was even open policy for the army to hunt species of tigers, for example. So while they were protected under Lenin and Trotsky's government, uh, the, Soviet, the Stalinist regime gave the army the task to exterminate them. The Persian cougar of the Caucasus was also exterminated. So just now there is a minimal policy of protection, but it's very important to distinguish the politics of the beginning of the revolution and the politics of that Stalinism later implied, because Stalinism is the negation of Bolshevism, of Marxism, of Leninism and Trotskyism. Bolshevism protected the environment, had begun to apply policies of protection and Stalinism went in the opposite direction and applied a disastrous productivist policies. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, capitalism deepened what Stalinism had already been doing. The Stalinist period is characterized not only by the aggression against the environment to produce and produce without control, but also with a bureaucratic method of not consulting with the population on the consequences, nor with the scientists, uh, because there was also such terror in the period that scientists did not want to warn of anything that went against the bureaucracy's plans because they would end up like many did, uh, assassinated for daring to say that such a policy could have bad consequences. So the capitalism that came after the Soviet Union fell did not reverse any of this, but made things even worse. I'm not going to go into it any further to give space to the other comrades to develop, but the most similar thing to capitalism has been Stalinism. This system that is threatening the existence uh, of life. You have to understand in Ukraine, for example, areas very close to the nuclear power plants are being bombed. There is a bureaucracy that became capitalist like the Russian one, and that is becoming imperialist in its method. That's why we think the sectors who deny the environmental issues, we think the people who think the negation of environmental issues being a product of socialism are mistaken. There's interested uh, parties of the media that try to link those things, but they are opposed. That's why it's very important that we draw up a program that takes into account 
many of the measures that were taken in the first years of the revolution, but also a policy against capitalism and go towards a system that not only isn't capitalist, but that takes up politics to not destroy the environment anymore, but protect it. We have to take those measures, but we can only take up those measures if we break with this system and if workers and the people are able to take the decisions. Because in this system where all of the levers of the economy are not in any democratic hands, there's no way. So a real democracy with people the people who suffer the consequences of the policies have to be the ones that can decide. So these techniques that cannot be used in a way. So this is my contribution. So everyone on the left needs to deepen an understanding on these issues and to know that there was a concrete experience in which a government can take measures in favor of the government that don't uh, hinder human needs, but the contrary. And Bolshevism had this in mind and the Stalinism that came afterward had nothing to do with Bolshevism, but the opposite. And it is very similar to what came afterward, which is capitalism. So it's no coincidence that the bureaucrats are themselves the ones who became capitalists and are now profiteering from the companies that they themselves privatized and are carrying out this fracticide against Ukraine. Gracias, Alejandro. Thank you, Alejandro. And before the next speaker, we insist that the mode of participation is also open in the chat where you can make a comment or ask a question. And after all the speakers have their go, they will take up questions. So next, we'll have Oleg Vernik of the Sakis Pratsi Independent Union of Ukraine. Go ahead, Oleg. Добрый день, уважаемые товарищи. Добрый день, уважаемые участники форума. Dear friends, greetings to you all. Good afternoon, everyone and all participants. One of the most terrible dates in history of Ukraine and the whole Eastern Europe is getting farther and farther away from us. On April 26, 1986, in Ukraine occurred the biggest nuclear catastrophe of our time, an explosion in the fourth generator of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. It is absolutely obvious that this tragedy was a kind of verdict on the bureaucratic system of the deformed workers' state of the USSR. Unlike the 
основным поражающим фактором стало именно радиоактивное загрязнение. Облако, образовавшееся от горящего реактора, разнесло различные радиоактивные материалы, прежде всего радионуклиды, йода и цезия по большей части Европы. Из 30-километровой зоны отчуждения э, вокруг атомной электростанции было эвакуировано все население, более 115 тысяч человек. Unlike the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Chernobyl explosion looked like a very powerful dirty bomb. The main damaging factor was radioactive contamination. The cloud that came out of the burning reactor transported various radioactive materials, mainly radionuclides of iodine and cesium over most of Europe. The entire population, more than 115,000 people, was evacuated from the 30 kilometers ex exclusion zone around the nuclear power plant. Погибло около 5000 ликвидаторов последствий катастрофы, среди которых было большое количество советских военнослужащих, а общее количество погибших людей составило за эти годы уже более 50 тысяч человек. Уже значительно позже мы стали получать информацию, что реактор РБМК-1000 уже задолго до аварии подвергался в кругах советских ученых сильной критике на предмет недостаточной безопасности его конструкции. Однако советская бюрократия не реагировала на эту критику и всячески пыталась ее засекретить и не дать ей хода. As a result of the so-called radiopathy, both directly during the liquidation of the consequences of the accident and after the accident, about 5,000 liquidators of the consequences of the catastrophe died, among whom were a large number of Soviet servicemen. And the total number of dead already exceeded 50,000 people. A long time later, we began to receive information that the RBMK-1000 reactor, long before the accident, was the subject of a strong criticism in Soviet scientific circles for the lack of safety of its design. But the Soviet bureaucracy did not react to this criticism and in every possible way tried to make it secret and not to disclose this information. Совершенно вопиющим преступлением советской партийно-государственной номенклатуры является проведение в Киеве парада трудящихся на 1 мая 1986 года. Уже тогда допустимый радиационный фон в Киеве превышал в десятки и сотни раз, был превышен в десятки и сотни раз. Но бюрократия, зная эту информацию, сознательно скрыла ее от трудящихся Киева и гостей столицы, подвергнув тем самым их смертельной опасности, которая впоследствии сказалась на их здоровье самым катастрофическим образом. Десятки тысяч трудящихся Украины 1 мая 1986 года приняли участие в этом смертельном для них праздновании Международного дня солидарности трудящихся. Еще одно преступление сталинистской бюрократии против рабочего класса бывшего Советского Союза. The absolutely heinous crime of the party nomenclatura and the Soviet state was the organization of the workers' parade in Kiev on May 1st, 1986. Even then, the permissible radiation background in Kiev was exceeded tens and even hundreds of times. 
but the bureaucracy having this information deliberate, deliberately headed from Kiev workers and visitors to the capital, thus exposing them to the deadly danger, which subsequently affected their health in a catastrophic way. On May 1st, 1986, tens of thousands of Ukrainian workers took part in this deadly celebration of the International <clears throat> Workers' Solidarity Day. One more crime of the Stalinist bureaucracy against the working class of the Soviet Union. Надо отметить, что молодое советское государство сразу после победы Октябрьской революции и стабилизации ситуации практически сразу стало уделять большое внимание проблеме охраны природы. Сохранились воспоминания о том, что в 1919 году молодой агроном Николай Подляпольский приехал в Москву на свою встречу к Ленину, чтобы э, рассказать э, о том, как безумная охота уничтожила существенную часть э, заповедной фауны в дельте, в дельте реки Волга. И э, Ленин тогда поддержал молодого агронома-эколога. И в этом же 1919 году с его одобрения был организован Астраханский заповедник в дельте реки Волга. Let us return to an earlier stage of history. It should be noted that immediately after the victory of the October Revolution and the stabilization of this situation, the young Soviet state began to pay great attention to the problem of na nature protection. There are memories that state that in 1919, the young agronomist Nikolai Poly Polyapolsky came to Moscow to meet Lenin to discuss with him how thoughtless hunting exterminated a significant part of the protected fauna in the Volga River Delta. Lenin lent support to the young agronomist and ecologist. In the same 1919, with his approval, the Astrakhan Nature Reserve was organized in the Volga Delta. And two years after that conversation, Lenin signed a degree according to which state protection was established over significant areas of wildlife. The territory of the USSR began to be covered with reserves and recreational areas. In 1924, several famous biologists founded the Russian Society for Nature Protection. But older sub Soviet uh, republics within the USSR were much less fortunate. Due to the Stalinist counter-revolution in the member republics of the USSR, the process of ecological vector in internal politics was suspended under pressure from the center. In fact, for example, in Ukraine, the Ukrainian Society for Nature Protection was founded only in July 1946, when for Stalin, in the period of total devastation and post-war famine, it was extremely necessary to flirt, to flirt with the peoples of the Soviet Union. А через два года после этого разговора Ленин подписал указ, согласно которому над существенными площадями живой природы следовало установить государственную защиту. Территория СССР тогда начала покрываться заповедниками и рекреационными зонами. В 1924 году известными биологами было основано Всероссийское общество охраны природы. А вот другим союзным республикам в составе СССР повезло намного меньше. В связи со сталинской контрреволюцией в союзных республиках СССР был союзного центра был союзного центра остановлен процесс экологического вектора 
во внутренней политике. Так, например, у нас в Украине Украинское общество охраны природы было разрешено только в июле 1946 года, когда Сталину было крайне необходимо в послевоенное время тотальной разрухи и голода максимально заигрывать с народами союзных республик. Совершенно очевидно, что... It is quite obvious that the Stalinist bureaucratic anti-working class counter-revolution also had an obvious, absolutely anti-ecological vector. I would highlight some of its important characteristics. First of all, since the late 1920s of the 20th century, the Soviet mass propaganda and educational system began to aggressively disseminate the key, the key thesis that men and nature are antagonistic, that human economic activity is opposed to nature and is a priority for the development of the Soviet state, even to the detriment of nature. Under the leadership of the Stalinist entourage, the words of the famous Soviet reader Michurin were introduced into all school textbooks in the USSR. We cannot expect favors from nature. To take them away from her is our task. In other words, a semantic construct about the confrontation between man and nature and the priority of economic activities was reintroduced. Any thesis on the search or harmony between human activities and existing ecosystems was extirpated. All environmental activities and environmental propaganda in the USSR were reduced exclusively to the establishment of reserves. It was assumed that a certain part of the territory remained protected from economic activities, while in the rest of the territory of the USSR, the state and its economic system were no longer limited at all. However, it should be noted that even the issue of nature reserves in a situation of strengthening counter-revolutionary Stalinism often did not warrant the preservation of virgin ecosystems. Here is a great example. The story around the Ukrainian reserve Askania Nova, Kherson province now temporarily occupied by Russian troops. The well-known Ukrainian ecologist and ornithologist Volodymyr Estantisky, director of the Askania Nova Nature Reserve, waged a hard struggle to preserve the reserve land that the People's Commissariat of Agriculture wanted to give to a state farm. In 1934, he, along many other of his colleagues, were arrested. Soon, in addition to the obvious confessions of sabotage and the creation of an underground counter-revolutionary organization, Staczynski declared that in his environmental research, he allowed himself to, risk, to disregard the economic realities of the construction of socialism. Moreover, in accordance to this unjustified desire, he fenced off 5,400 hectares of the steppe, not handing them over to the state farm for tillage. With the arrest of Storczynski and his colleagues, the ecological discourse in the USSR died out completely. 
after the defeat of the Escania Nova Nature Reserve, few people wanted to delve into this subject again. No one wanted to follow the fate of the talented ornithologist and ecologist who was sent to the concentration camps where he died in 1942. In the following years, the anti-environmental vector of domestic policy in the USSR only worsened. And it is quite obvious that the Chernobyl nuclear catastrophe was nothing but an end result and a crime of the Stalinist bureaucracy against the working class of the USSR and above all of Ukraine and Belarus, which suffer the most from this ecological catastrophe. Let's see if the general ecological situation in Ukraine has changed after the restoration of capitalism. It is quite obvious that it has not changed. And in many aspects, we are even observing serious deteriorations and problems. Industrial enterprises of Ukrainian oligarchs, in order to increase the super profits of their private owners, refuse en masse to, expend, to spend money on environmental programs in their enterprises. Ukrainian workers often work in the most difficult anti environmental conditions and receive only meager bonuses for their unhealthy working conditions. And any attempt at struggle by environmental and trade union organizations is met with strong resistance from organized capital. We have struggled for many years in the grassroots trade union organization of my union, Protection of Labor, at the Karpatnet Fekim company for fair compensation to the workers for harmful, harmful working conditions. The situation around the aluminum plant in the Ukrainian city of Mykolaiv, belonging to the Russian billionaire Deripaska, looks like an absolutely absolute environmental tragedy. For the sake of his super profits, Deripaska is already storing more than 50 million tons of the poisonous substance, red mud, directly on the territory of the plant which spreads in the air of Nikolev and condemns workers to death from cancer. This situation seems especially cynical due to the fact that at this moment, Nikolaev is suffering from the monstrous shelling by the Russian invaders. While the Ukrainian state does not even try to remove this polluting company from the property of that Russian billionaire. It is true that capitalism has an international character and capital knows no limits in its expansion. In recent years, deforestation of Ukrainian forest has increased significantly in the famous mountainous region of Western Ukraine, the Carpathians. Forests are massively logged, mainly to provide cheap timber for the European Union market. Uh, 
Under pressure from the environmental community, a moratorium on the export of raw timber came into force in Ukraine on November 1, 2015. However, almost immediately, this decision was condemned by the International Monetary Fund and the European Union. And already in September 2018, a law was passed in Ukraine allowing the export of firewood to the European Union. It is clear that this law has passed to circumvent the moratorium on the export of raw timber. Capitalism is not only an anti-ecological system by its nature, but also becomes very cynical when environmental issues affect the super profits of the major capitalists in the imperialist centers. We are absolutely convinced that a decisive goal, global turn, towards ecology can only take place if humanity adopts a planet-wide democratic socialist program. Only the politics of international eco-socialism will give the workers of the world a real chance to save our civilization from a global ecological catastrophe onward to socialism, towards an ecologically oriented planetary society. Thank you so much. Thank you, Oleg. And now uh, we shall continue. Let's greet our comrade Manuel Romero Garcia from CIPCO. Are you there, Manuel? I have a presentation, but I cannot put it. Anyways, uh, it doesn't allow me to share my screen. If I can, there is no problem. I will do it without, without a presentation. Give us a minute. A ver ahí, Manuel. Vale, ahora. Manuel. Bueno, creo que se ve más o menos. I think you can see it. Se ve bien. Se ve. Do you see it? Yes. Go ahead. Antes que nada, vamos a presentarnos. Before anything. We're going to present our collective, so you can know which we can know us. In CIPCOM, we are an organization that is rather new. We study the feasibility of economic planification as an alternative to the model of production. Today, having as a basis the the ecophysicist eco advances and also the more radical democratic side. We took it as a, a tool to substitute anarchy, market anarchy, and change it for a system where producers can decide collectively what to produce, how to produce it, and what are the, the ecological limits to impose on that production. 
you can find us in our web page if anyone wants to know more about us. Now we are going to see how we understand from our collective how we can develop ecology. First of all, the idea that ecologism was only present with Lenin and Trotsky in the 30s. It is completely right, first of all, because the presence of ecologism in the beginning of the Soviet Union is not the same as current ecologism. It was more conservative. The natural reserves in Russia, developed in the time, were founded to preserve the species, fauna, flora, but it is not enough. They are not what's necessary for the current crisis. It was by bourgeois intellectuals. And we have to include human activity and nature. This idea is born in the Soviet Union with Federal towards the end towards the end of the Stalinist period. It was the one that gave way to the debates around the famous states of the development in Roma in 1970. Most of the Marxists that took this text as an incapacity to It's an incapacity of men or the belief in the capacity to go beyond the barrier of nature, known as human exceptionalism, that human, human was capable of surpassing nature because it was something different than the rest of, of the species. It was used in the Soviet Union many of the anti-ecological performances of the Stalinist period gave way to many debates around ecologists. But the main figure in this was that the expansion of socialism point of view what he said was that ecology should be understood as a whole. We understand the ecological crisis. We understand that we can preserve those spaces and protect those spaces that are vital and keep producing and taking into account the factors that affect those spaces. Ecology and stopping climate change needs a global intervention where the entire territory is taken into account, not separated by country or activity. Other, another scientist so that it is necessary to calculate the economic efficacy of individual plants which are novel. Not every company individually, but globally. To make a global plan, to have into account success from one republic to another. It was a great issue in the capitalist countries where it was impossible to globally understand and ecologically comprehend the continuity between man and nature, 
how the climate catastrophe could be avoided. The critics, our critics to these proposals of sitcoms have to do with a bureaucratic critique. First of all, it is true that the preferences of the, of the populations and the pressure groups were generally ignored. Not all of them, but by the invasion of nature in Moscow had a lot of strength. But nevertheless, their ideas didn't affect the policies as it was intended because there were fundamental differences between ecologists and intellectuals and economists and planners. There wasn't a symbiosis among these people, which carried out a lot of the issues around ecology and in especially with Chernobyl. These proposals were taken into account in this period, the planification of the Soviet Union was taken as something from the past that had to be changed. And for five years later, in fact, it changed, but it wasn't a democratic planification. Manuel, could you speak a little bit slower because of the, of the translations? And a little bit louder, the volume. And could you expand the, the slides? <laughs> Another critic that I have, the first critic was critic as the fear was the way having into account the, the lack of the, the scarcity, this causes a problem. There is no measure of these uh, resources. Only in the market can exist. In many occasions, nature is considered a productive work. It was considered as something free to use. That was for a long time by the companies of the Soviet Union. Uh, just as we said before, in particular cases, they were very damaged by the previous policies, the productive unities had issues. But if the crisis wasn't that severe, it was not limited. There was an issue because this makes us not understand the ecological issue as a global productive issue. Planification can only be if we are not separated. Because we can't make a, an efficient production in a capitalist system. In a global level, the global output was planned. We, in this sense, we propose that planification is carried having into account multidimensional criteria and limitations in species and that is detailed. There needs to be limits informational limits of processing and data intake, which makes this criteria, this multidimensional criteria to be hard to be implemented. 
So we leave a reference here. We translate an article that explains in what way we can incorporate ecological approaches, gas emissions, soil degradation. It's just a productive model. We put it as limits in our planification. In the sense we need to reach the goal, it has to be democratically decided. We have to be clear on that. We need to be put the limits. Another consequence, another democracy is us. The final demand was not was not planned. If you don't have into account that final demand, this causes that what needed to be produced wasn't produced. And then production was raw. Due to the technical limitations of the Soviet Union and the interests of the party, the criteria were in steel quantities. What details did the motor have to have? How much the motor had to wait? What type of aspect? was more attractive by the consumers. Contradictions occurred. Toys that weighed a lot of kilos were awarded because they had spent the necessary steel when there was no necessity, no war necessity. Just to reach that goal that wasn't necessary. And in spite of that production was efficient, consumer goods production wasn't that good. So this took place in Soviet Union and Eastern Germany. But this, in the end, wasn't possible due to the technique. One of the projects that was most interesting was the OGAS. It was a proposal proposed a method to plan the economy in a global way that integrated a mechanism among the proposals among between the workers. We are not going to get into the specifics of this mechanism. And it allowed to readjust the production and the demand and the interaction between production and demand because it wasn't adjusted because the consumers did not have an opinion a direct opinion on how to produce. And this, ecologically, didn't allow the production in a production unit in Ukraine, for example, didn't have anything, didn't have into account the necessities and the efforts of what was produced in Siberia, Siberia. And this naturally Because the union of the bureaucrats and the workers, because they didn't have this feeling that their preferences were adjusted globally. <clears throat> then in the school of Siberia proposed 
something similar to forecast, just having into account ecological criteria. Among these, in this proposal was this proposal was very similar to the article we released, and also this article by Diana Kruskovsky. And as we said before, the ecological danger was based on the scientific evaluations on the soil and the oil gas, and also the limits that the population is, is willing to, to surpass for the ecological crisis. Having into account this incorporation, this ecological criteria, we can have more efficiency because we are conscious of all the outer factors. But many of these factors in capitalism, many of the things that are tackled globally because they are produced in this crisis. We elaborated a project in which the entire world can be a part of this production unit. So the social costs could be dealt socially. There won't be a street rider effect that exists now with the companies. And the one that existed in the Soviet Union, because the production unit weren't conscious of the external factors and because the bureaucracy didn't deal with those limitations imposed by the scientific community in the Soviet Union and also by the affected population, like the case, never have a case, and in Chernobyl, where the well being for the population was something secondary in favor of hiding the information. So this has been our intervention about ecology and the Soviet Union. When ecolog ecologism was debated and developed, and if you want to see our proposal and read our articles, you can follow us in our social media and our web page where there are translations for several languages about planification. Manuel. Thank you, Manuel. To continue, it's a turn off from Ukraine, Dimitri Saidov, who is an activist from the organization for clean air and member of the Ukrainian Socialist League. I think that Dimitri couldn't make it in the beginning. In the beginning, Alejandro, he sent a text that we can read. So we can read a text. Misha has it. And you can hear it on the Spanish channel. And everyone will translate from that. Misha. Bueno. Hacelo de directly in Spanish. Do it slowly for the translators. Text by Dimitri Saidov, member of the Ukrainian Socialist League, militant of the environmentalist organization for clean air. Title. Techno capital versus life. Good afternoon. The topic for discussion today is the impact of digital technology on the environment. 
the problem is not only in production, but in operation. In itself, the emergence of this activity is a certain symptom of the crisis of capitalism. And it is like a financial pyramid, but with a technical bias against the background of the growing unemployment rate and financial insecurity, people go in different directions in search of at least some kind of income. In the beginning, different organizations are quickly developed that promise to make money in a very easy way. Investors get tricked and dragged into debt to banks or scammers. People get frustrated and look for new ways to get rich. And they find them in the most unexpected spheres. With the emergence, with emergence of cryptocurrencies and mining in Ukrainian society, a, a way similar to a gold rush has also arisen. Whoever had at least some notions about server technologies and had at least basic capital spent large sums on equipment and installed their own farms for mining in their house or apartment. Gradually, the word Bitcoin became better known in society and there was some euphoria about an opportunity to get rich, seemingly without doing anything. You set up a farm, configure it, and that's it. You live carefree. The machine will do everything for you. But not everything is so simple. We will not delve now into the economic problems, nor into questions of legislation. We are interested in how this activity affects the environment. Let's imagine a small miner. He has bought the necessary equipment to install at least 10 graphic cards. He has installed a good SSD with 512 gigabytes. And he started the process. And what happened in the end? Now he doesn't need heating. Such a lot of equipment gets so hot that you can't even compare it with the best cast iron batteries. But looking at the other side of the coin, we can be very, we can be very horrified by the consequences. Depending on the cryptocurrency, a given SSD can die in as little as 40 days. This disk is not cheap. It remains only to throw it in the trash. I did not manage to find in Ukraine points to process these drives. In a year, a single miner will throw into the landfill nine units. For a city with a population of 3,000 inhabitants, we can safely multiply this figure by 200 miners. So we will have 1,800 such SSDs per year. What happens then in the cities with a population of more than 1 million. Also, I could not find any information about the degradation time of an, N an SSD. Some articles even inform us about the eternity of the materials. Even if the time is 100 years, it is terrible to imagine how many of them will accumulate in a given period. But this is a trifle. Now we'll talk about the most important element in a farm. Graphic cards. Graphic cards were invented to facilitate the work of the central processing unit of a computer and improve graphic capabilities. But over time, they have become more powerful compared to central processing units. As a result, miners started using them as a means to generate coins. The first thing to note is that graphic cards are also discarded after they have been used. 
and they are not recycled anywhere. They last longer than SSDs, but they are much larger in size and weight. This means that you throw away more material than if you throw away several SSDs at once. As I said before, a small miner will have about 10 graphic cards. What if it's a big farm? Where can there be, where can there be over 100 units? And all this equipment is simply thrown away, like all the other items in the farm, motherboards, coolers, cables, processors, and racks. But the racks can still be sold and are much less likely to end up in a landfill. But this is only a part of the problem we have with graphic cards. A large amount of electricity is needed to generate cryptocurrencies, which has repeatedly resulted in blackouts in cities. According to calculations by the editors of the German newspaper site online, in 2018, farms consumed 45.8 kilowatts per hour to generate one Bitcoin. And there are more demanding coins that require more, more electricity. The amount of carbon dioxide emitted by allows in year terms range from 22 to 22.9 million tons. To give an example, it is emissions of full production capacities of Ukraine multiplied by eight times. As for, the as for the premises for farms, it is difficult to breathe there with, without heating. But I want to clarify immediately that large corporations usually have all the necessary cooling, but only very large companies can afford it in such quantities. There are a few of them in Ukraine. Basically mining here is still at the artisanal level. Instead of buying boxes or racks for servers, they make them out of wood themselves, which, also, which is also very environmentally unfriendly. The question is, what should socialists do about this problem? We are well aware that only a radical socialist transformation of the world order will bring us closer to solving this problem. It may not be the best example to mention the Communist Party of China, pure state bureaucracy, which has led China to, to a terrible environmental situation. But not long ago, the CCP completely banned any cryptocurrency activity in their country. And this happened despite the fact that China could easily become the most advanced country in mining. In other words, even the Stalinist counter-revolutionary bureaucracy in the face of the threat of ecological catastrophe made a quite correct decision. My position is that genuine socialists all over the world should also demand at this stage an absolute ban on the circulation of technical currencies. In any case, until a more environmentally friendly technical solution is found for the mining of cryptocurrencies. Thank you very much. Well, now we have the stage of questions. We have several. And for time reasons, I'm going to mention them and then Oleg, Manuel, Manuel and Alejandro each one of them with 10 minutes can comment our answer, the ones they consider. Is it all right? There is a question that says, 
if you know in any place techniques of production that are applied that do not generate pollution. There are several questions about nuclear energy. What do you think about it? There is a questions. There are several questions about what are the policies to transition into socialism and what production techniques will be applied that don't pollute and what policy should we have in regards to scientific investigation and technological development. There is a question about Chernobyl that says in what conditions was Chernobyl built and the reasons why it ended up in a disaster. For Oleg, a question about the situation of the occupation by the Russian troops of the Saporizhia nuclear plant, because there are sectors in the media that says that there are conditions for a nuclear disaster like Chernobyl. And there are questions about the role assigned to the youth in this stage in regards to the, to the environment. Oleg? What time do you have? 10 minutes. Top. 10 minutes. Adelante, Oleg. Go ahead, Oleg. I would like to say. In two or three minutes, the Dimitri will connect in some way. If you can connect him, so he can join in a few minutes. I ask the moderators and those who are dealing with technical issues. Can I answer your questions? Please go ahead because we are out of time. There's another panel later. I am willing to answer on the situation of the central in Saporizhia. I have some details because yesterday I was studying this issue more profoundly. Uh, it is a very important issue because there is in this subject by the Russian propaganda, Russian troops and the Russian government states that the Ukrainian troops are the ones shooting at the nuclear central, which is wrong. The Ukrainian troops are not shooting that territory, that land. The thing is that the Saporizhia plant is functioning in a way that all the energy is being provided to the territories that are under Ukrainian Ukrainian uh, territories. So they don't have any need to shoot at the power plant. At the same time, the Russian army 
that is in the territory of the power plant installed parts of its, its armament and the means of transport in the area of this power plant. Part of the weapon systems are very close to the power plant. And from there, they are shooting. The Russian are shooting to cities like Nikopol and other cities that are surrounding there that also belong to the, the same province. But at the same time, a lot of people are wondering, where do the sh shooting come? Who is shooting? Where do the shooting come? Some friends of mine, activists, are in Ergodan, in the occupied city, where the power plant is placed. And they gave me some details, the last details about this conflict and this situation. The Russian army is attacking, is shooting the territory that is adjacent to the power plant. The shooting come from the Russian side and all the people of the Russian army there is in that area is let known that there's going to be shooting from their, their the Russian army. And so they live with all their installations and all their transportation to occupy that territory and ensure the bombings and the shooting. So there was a discussion among the propagandists on both sides. All of them were waiting an arbitrator, a mediator that was objective and the International Association of Atomic Energy sent ambassadors and emissaries to provide some clarity to the situation. And it was just published an article, a document, a sentence by the association where all the points are very clear and, it, and they confirm that the Russian army is causing very dangerous conditions, a lot of danger that could cause a possible nuclear incident. So the Russian troops are the ones causing a nuclear catastrophe in that territory. So there is a proposal, an optional alternative. They propose to the Russians to abandon the area of the power plant and form a territory, a buffer in a 10 kilometer radio. So no troops, no Russian troops are allowed, but the Russian army refused to accept that proposal. They don't say anything, but it's, it is obvious that the Russians are not willing to abandon the territory of the nuclear power plant. That is to answer in some few words, what is the situation of the 
nuclear power plants. My colleague Dimitri Seldov has joined and is with us. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Oleg. To continue, as Dimitri joined, his intervention was read. We're going to we're going to ask you if in a few minutes you want to make some comments. Your your intervention was read fully. Is he listening? Is he hearing you? Yes, I'm translating. He will comment at the end of the of the event if it was necessary. This is the end. What type of comments do you need about the article or the power plant? Tell him that, tell him to make some general comments because it is the, the end of the panel. If he wants to give an opinion, having into account that we are finishing just five minutes. I want to emphasize on the topic that the advance of cryptocurrencies and digital technologies, they should be the crypto industry is killing the environment and this only benefits capitalism and the magnitude of all of this has severe consequences. Regards to cryptocurrencies, I think that it is a way that is very fashionable and that it slaves a lot of people. And it is increasingly affecting negatively the economies of different countries. The system of cryptocurrencies is creating myths about the well-being of what can bring what this can bring to its users. What is the damage that cryptocurrency is causing? It is a pollution of carbon monoxide. And the waste of the parts of the computer that are thrown away after the process of creating cryptocurrency. If we talk about the magnitude, the article, I indicate that I indicate that pollution 
the dilution of carbon monoxide by this mining process surprises by eight times the entire pollution of Ukraine. And this also, in an extreme case, we have Indonesia, where the level of pollution there is terrible. And if this process if we, if we don't do anything to avoid this and prevent this process from going forward, the minor cryptocurrency, this is going to affect in a severe way the ecology and the environment of the entire world, not only a few countries in particular. That's all that I wanted to add. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitri. We're going to ask Manuel if in five minutes, strictly, he can make a few comments. Manuel? I just I just wanted to share some articles in case there are any, any doubts or for anyone who wants to go deeper in these issues. So here are some articles. So if no one has any question for me, So just that. Thank you, Manuel. So there we have on the chat the links. Alejandro, I will try to be brief. I'm going to upload to the ISL website a series of materials some articles that comrades of ours have written on this issue to socialize on this issue that is the least known. It's important to know that in that period over a hundred years ago, when these issues were in their beginnings, I think the policies that were implemented were, were conservationist, that was one point. There was areas of conservation, but there was another aspect of it, which was the scientific investigation. Because it wasn't just a policy of conservation, but the intellectuality of the period was allowed to investigate and to study freely to the process that was then interrupted because the Stalinist counter-revolution came shortly after. It's important to know this because like in many other issues, the Bolsheviks were pioneers and something that came from the period of Marx himself, which was in trying to understand and harmonize the relationship between humankind and nature and not be contradictory. So we're going to upload articles about this. About the Stalinist period, I think one of the things that unites the Stalinist period and the current capitalist period has to do with the bureaucratic aspect. It was very bureaucratic in that it censored the scientific community so there was a bureaucratic planification. And this has a point in common with the capitalist anarchy because capitalism refuses to plan, but the destruction happens because 
all of their economy is not based on anyone's need, but on the need for profits. So the bureaucratic centralization, planification, and the capitalist anarchy have a point in common in the destruction they generate. And there is a common point against both, which is the necessity of the working class democracy, which is had been implemented in those first years and is something that we need to recover. If we think that it will be possible to generate a democratic and sustainable production. I think some, some activities have to be prohibited outright. They just, there's no use for them. So fracking has to be prohibited as an activity. A open, open air mining has to be prohibited as an activity. I think we need to advance towards leaving behind fossil fossil fuels as an energy basis. We have to prohibit what comrades, the comrade was talking about recently about the farms of cryptocurrency. So there are activities that we need to completely ban and replace for other things. So open air mining has to be banned. We need to return to traditional mining with social control, with democratic planning, with the communities that have to democratically decide if these activities are useful or not. We have to advance towards a agrarian reform to democratically decide how to produce food, not like now where they just produce massively soy because that is what is profitable. And we have to advance towards an agroecological production of food without agrotoxic. And in energy, we have to advance towards clean energy. And there is the issue of nuclear energy. I think this is a debate that we need to open uh, clearly. We have comrades that work and are technicians and professionals of nuclear energy. Here in Argentina, for example, in the different nuclear power plants. Nuclear power, nuclear power is in itself uh, contaminating like petroleum is. But in the hands of capitalists, it ends up in disasters like Chernobyl, etc. Although many of the technological advances like nuclear medicine, so nuclear energy is used for many things, but the, there is a problem of who controls it, whether there is a democratic working class control or there isn't. So under capitalism, it's one thing, but in the democratic hands of the working class, it could be used in a different way, but it is a debate that we have to have because there is the issue of a, the nuclear discharge, what to do with it. So it, there is a debate. So it's, it's not just pushing a button and moving backwards. So today there is no possibility of automatically just pushing the off button and sustaining the world. What we can do is sustain any activity that will in itself continue destroying the environment or any other one that the current ruling class can use it. So the nuclear debate divides people across the board. So it's a debate we need to have. We could organize a forum with a debate with the two positions in favor and against nuclear energy and it would be a positive debate. But I think we can agree in social 
control in democratic decision making and in taking into account the, the community's opinion on things and in prohibiting activities that are contaminating in themselves and need to be replaced with others. Now, these are all debates that we need to we need to have, absolutely, because I think there's a lot of superficiality in some environmental organizations that propose solutions that are not realistic, not able to be carried out. So we need to have a more serious discussion to find a solution and to have those solutions not be kind of opposed to nature. Now, there was a question on which are the currents of the left that are productivist. So there are groups on the left that think we need to think some environmental solutions, but without stopping production, that is, that is the priority. And we don't believe this. We think there are activities that need to be banned outright. Some ask who are they here in Argentina? It's the Partido Obrero, the PO, that holds this position. Internationally, there are others. Now, the reality of the ecological movements are making some of these organizations change their policies. And I think this has to do a lot with the influence that the youth has in these movements. So this is making some left organizations shift in their positions with until not long ago thought that it was a kind of snob position to be ecological and that now they are taking these discussions more seriously. So until a few years ago, there was very few environmental organizations linked to left-wing organizations. And now there are many ecological organizations linked to the revolutionary left. So, seeing the planet, it's clear that it is urgent to find a solution, which is to leave this system behind and move advance towards a different system because there isn't a planet B. So what measures are necessary? The, the main one is the social class that leads society. Because with the with the capitalist class that leads the fate of humanity, there is no possibility of any solution to this. They are leading us towards barbarism. So we either defeat capitalism and stop it and move towards a different society. Unfortunately, the future of humanity will be questioned. Now to do this, we need to build organizations that taking up the environmental issues, also propose a complete solution to humankind's problems and to defeat the system and advance towards a new system. There's an important debate from the ISL. We have an environmental program that is part of a complete pro program for changing society as a whole. So this debate has been put on the table and we propose that people who are part of this struggle join the general struggle for a different society. It's the only possible way for all of us together to fight for a different society. And when there is more complex issues like the nuclear debate, then the open debate, democratic debate has to be the way forward because we think no one has a, the eliminated truth. If this was the case, we wouldn't have the problems we have. So that's all for, for me and thank you very much for everyone.